we're continuing on in our epic series today, and I know I've mentioned this time and time again, but the theme is yet before us one more time. This theme of conditional promises. If we do what God's word says, then we'll be blessed. If we don't do God's word and what it says, then guess what? You're going to have some challenges. Today we get to see someone who put this into practice in their life and God delivers for them in a very big way. So I hope you see it as an encouragement this morning that you, you hope, like whatever you're going through, whatever challenges you might face, when we put God first, when we trust God, he will come through on our behalf. I use that word trust. Um, I watched Creflo Dollar on TV while I was getting ready about a week ago. I don't often watch him, but he said something that I thought was pretty profound that maybe will impact us today and maybe we could build upon just a little bit. He said that most sin boils down to a lack of trusting God. Think about that for a moment. I think there's a lot of truth in that. You take issues of our day that are challenging, like uh, maybe... Uh, going out and being in relationships when we're not married. When we do something like that, maybe we don't trust what God's word says and that it's right that the best kind of a relationship you can have is a monogamous one between a man and a woman while they're married, right? We try to get ahead of ourselves. Or maybe you take an issue like Don was talking about a little earlier about finances and we don't live out our finances biblically, and when we don't do that, what we're in effect saying is that God, when I read verses like Malachi chapter 3, and it tells me that you're going to protect my finances, that you're going to provide for me, or Matthew chapter 6, that you're going to take care of my needs, um, we're saying, I don't trust you in that. My plan is better than your plan, God. I can handle this. I've got it. You could take that and put it on any area of sin in our life. And I think you find it to be true. We're not trusting what God's word says. In reverse, if we're tempted in any of these areas and we overcome them, if we stand in resistance to those things, then guess what? We're showing and telling God, I trust you. I believe your plan is the best plan. I believe you've got my back. I believe that I can put your word into practice and when I do, I will be blessed. I'll be protected, I'll be provided for, and I hope today that's the kind of sense that we come away with, that we could trust God at his word in a world that is full of uh, uh, confusion. And I want to encourage you today, as you're doing even right now, during the message today in particular, but really each and every week as we gather together, let this time be sacred. You know, ditch the phone after you update and tell everybody that you're here so that they'll come online. You know, put it by the wayside. You know, some of us, maybe we need to do that and go old school and get our old Bible and put it in our hand because we're tempted by those notifications and things that start popping up and they become a distraction for us. What if we gave God that hour and we really focused on it and we didn't move around and didn't get coffee during the service? Come on, Jesus. Get coffee before the service, right? And just focused on Christ during those few moments, how different might we walk out of here. Lord, we come before you this morning, and we're going to touch on a weighty subject. In fact, we're touching on two. The first one was the conditional promise in which I've already let the cow out of the bag that you're going to come through. You're going to deliver on Jehoshaphat's behalf. Lord, the second one really has to do a spiritual warfare, and I have no doubt that the devil wants to come in and bring confusion. The devil wants to come in and create distraction. The devil wants to come in and keep us from not just hearing what you have to say to us today, but being able to apply it in our lives. So right now I bind the devil, the thief, the liar, from coming in and try to speak confusion into our hearts and to our minds. And Father, we speak life and love. Lord, we say that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and the power to put it into practice in our lives. And we really believe that today. And we ask you to do that today. Would you move today as we study your word that we would have a moment that would last not just the few moments that we're here, but would last all throughout the week and really turn into a lifestyle for us in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. Amen, amen, and amen. So might today's message help us to build trust in whatever area we lack So the first theme I wanted to talk about was really that theme of conditional promises. The second theme I want to talk about today where most of our energy is going to be directed is on this theme of spiritual warfare. And I think that all too often we're infants when it comes to that. We lack understanding, we lack 
application. It's something that at times can be hard, but is vitally important, as you'll see in our generation, to understand and apply this subject because we live in a world that is at war. Second Chronicles chapter 20, that's where we're going to spend our time today. So if you do have your Bibles, pull them out, put them up on your phone, or watch them on the screens. It's a very important subject matter. It says, after this, the Moabites and Ammonites and some of the Mennonites, no, Mennonites, came to war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already at Hazan Tamar. The reality of the world that Jehoshaphat lived in was one where there was a physical war that was taking place, right? They're getting ready to get invaded. They're overwhelmed. They're outnumbered. They really stand no hope, and he knows it. You're going to see he's afraid. He's alarmed. What would his reaction be to that difficult circumstance? But I'm here to tell you we live in that same world at war. You might not know this, but we still live in a physical war, even though we don't see it here in America. Do you know that the American military drops a bomb every 12 minutes right now as we're sitting here? As we're sitting here today, multiple bombs will be dropped somewhere in the world by our military. Our military is at war even as we sit here in this day and age. There's wars that surround us all over the world. Just because it's not happening here in Jacksonville doesn't mean that it's not happening, right? In fact, I think the enemy likes to shelter us from some of that so that we don't see it, so that we're not engaged either in the natural or in the spiritual, but that doesn't mean that the reality doesn't exist nonetheless, right? It's so much easier to live in a world of comfort, is it not? It's so much easier to turn on the TV and watch The Bachelor or Bachelorette. I never watched that show, I promise you, right? I do it just to support my wife, right? Or us guys, if we're really cool, I'm going to watch SEAL Team 6 and, you know, come on, I'm going to watch all the cops and live PD and all that good stuff, right? It's so much easier to go and live in this world of comfort and entertainment, right? We don't want to face the reality that really surrounds us that I'm going to make a case for today in Scripture. So there was a vast army coming against Jehoshaphat to kill him. There's always a vast army coming against the people of God to try to kill us and thwart God's plans in our lives. In fact, the second you raised your hand to say that you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the devil can no longer possess your soul, but he will do everything he can to oppress you. He will do everything to keep you from advancing the kingdom of God. Sometimes he does it through difficult things, and other times he does it through things that seem all too good, like comfort and entertainment, that become idolatry for us if we're not careful. He doesn't want you in the battle. He wants us watching TV. He doesn't want us on our knees. He doesn't want us praying. He doesn't want us fasting. He wants to continue to see us and those around us get beat up by the systems of this world of which he is firmly in control. But yet, the sooner we can come to grips with the fact that we live in a world at war, the sooner we can begin to thrive in the midst of it. You can thrive, and Mary Jo's excited, I hope you are too. The sooner you can begin to thrive in the midst of it. See, the Bible talks and speaks of this heavenly battle that's been taking place since the day of Satan's fall. We live in a day and age of cosmic rebellion that has implications both in the heavenlies and in the natural. There are casualties all around us, and Scripture says that the prince of the power of the air is firmly in control of the systems of this world. And guess what? I have some bad news for you as we get started because I'm going to give you some really good news later. It's going to get worse. The Bible says that before Jesus returns... These things are going to get darker and darker so that we as believers can shine brighter and brighter, that we can be beacons of light in the midst of darkness. That's the calling that God has on your life. He wants you to be salt and light in this hurting world, bringing hope to those that are around us. Ultimately, Christ is going to get the victory. He's going to vanquish the devil, but right now, the devil is in control. I don't want to give him too much power, yet I have to acknowledge the fact that the Bible actually says that he was the most cunning, the most beautiful, the most powerful amongst the angels when he fell. So he is smarter than you and I. If you try to go at it on your own without the power of the Holy Spirit, without believers around you, without understanding the nature of spiritual warfare, you will be defeated. I promise you he will beat you. 
You cannot do this in your own power. And look just how successful he has been of late, affecting even the saints. The Bible says before Jesus returns, the time would need to be shortened lest even the very elect of God be saved, or none of us be saved. It means that all of us are susceptible to it. Every, inst every institution of the world has been corrupted by sin. Think about the things that Christians used to hold as moral um, outrage you know, to us when these things occurred and how people don't do anything about it anymore. Not, you know, maybe uh, we used to carry this banner. So in the 1970s, Roe versus Wade, right? When abortion first became legal, Christians rally cried around it, man. They were out there saying, no, this is murder. This is not God's plan for your life. We want to help people, we want to love people. They used to do protests out there trying to prevent people from walking in there and making that difficult decision. Know that you can be forgiven if you've made that decision as well. Praise be to God that he could forgive us, he could save us, he could help us. But the ramifications of those kinds of things are deep and painful, yet where are Christians standing up to say something about that kind of an outrage in our day and age, right? How about same-sex attraction? Used to be something that was challenging, right? Now we just accept it, and everybody says it's okay, and everything, everybody says everything's fine. Now don't get me wrong, no one sin's more important than another sin. Don't go pointing your fingers at somebody else like this, because you got like four pointing back at you, right? Because we're all jacked up, we're all in the same boat. I'm not trying to say that one sin's worse than another sin. No, all sin is sin, right? Not just same-sex attraction, but uh, you know, violating God's word when it comes to having sex with whoever we want, whenever we want, outside of the context of marriage. Is that not sin? Yes. Yet, you know how many Christians do it? Why y'all getting so quiet? <laughs> the divorce rate amongst Christians is the same as non-Christians. The devil has done a masterful job of deceiving us all and taking us to a place of lethargy where we no longer stand in opposition to these things that people once cried out about, right? That's part of his tactic, that's part of his strategy. He turns us rather to seeing the nature of the real world war that surrounds us to you know, numbing ourselves through things like comfort and entertainment. He's been super successful in that, even in areas like debt. I couldn't get this off my mind, I shared a little bit of it online, but the more I kept thinking about it, Every single institution of the world has been corrupted by sin. Every single one. Name me one that hasn't. Guess what? Even the church. The church is corrupted by sin. The church is infiltrated by sin. We need to go to war against sin in our own lives and strive for holiness. Let me give you but a few examples. Um, the banking institution. The government, right? What do I mean by that? So how many of you think 0% interest rates are a good thing? One. Yeah, sort of. I'll tell you why not. So it used to be in our country that you would save money, right? You had money in the bank, you would save it, you'd get interest for it, and then because of that, um, you would hopefully be able to retire. And then what's happened in our day and age is 0% interest rates. The bank doesn't give you no money when you put your money in the bank. But then the government does this thing called inflation that they say is about 2 to 2.5%. Two but the reality of such is it's far more than 2.5%, is it not? Have you been to the gas tank lately? Have you tried to go to the grocery store? You can't get out of Publix without paying like 100 bucks. I'm not that old, I'm kind of old, but not that old. And then Mary Jo and I, when the kids were little, we used to go to Publix and it'd be like 30 bucks for all five of us, right? Now I go out there and it's like 40 bucks and it's just me and her. I mean, am I the only one who senses this? So this thing called inflation is actually theft. They're stealing from you, and why we deem this to be acceptable is beyond me, because even at 2%, go 10 years, that means everything's 20% more. Did your wage go up by 20% in the past 10 years? We're getting poorer and poorer and poorer. They're setting us up for failure. I call it the death and debt paradigm. They're trying to steal from us. They're trying to enslave us through debt. It's the devil that's in control of those systems. Maybe there's a few others that he's control of. Let me, let me examine here. How about the healthcare system? 
man, great. In each one of these, there's good things. There's been great strides. People are living longer than ever. Uh, God does amazing things through the hands of doctors, does he not? I mean, you see these miracles when people get healed. But guess what? At the same time, these pharmaceutical companies have become the number one peddler of drugs on the planet. You know how many people they've given Oxycontin to? And then the oxy's more expensive than heroin, so then the people go and get on heroin because they can't get the oxy, and then now the devil throws this crazy stuff called fentanyl in there, and then how many of our friends and loved ones have died? I did at least three or four funerals just last year on that subject alone. I have Narcan in my car because we're afraid that there's people around us. There's been, in the past two weeks, there's been people in here geeking out on heroin, and they're in here, and we had to escort them out or try to help them. That's how deep this is, man. And how many of you might think, just maybe, I'm getting a conspiracy theory here, but I think everything's corrupted, that the food they give you to try to fatten you up and all those preservatives and all those crazy things might lead to you getting sick, come on Jesus, and then you need the health care, and then they go, am I being crazy, or, or am I too crazy, okay. All right, here I'm gonna get myself in trouble with this one. How many of you think the drug war's been a victory? Y'all are getting real quiet now. I mean, I'm going to get myself in deep. Okay, guess what? You can't legislate morality. The only thing that's going to help somebody, this is a drug addict, recovered drug addict speaking from here, is a change of heart by the power of the Holy Spirit coming inside of us to change us from the inside out. So regardless of your political stance on something like marijuana, right? Let me tell you how this works, sadly, in our day and age. And I'm not saying I've got the answers. I'm not saying, I'm telling you, you can't get the victory in these things because every single one of them is corrupt. But take, take an issue like this. One of the largest reasons that people are incarcerated is because of small drug offenses, right? So then that fills up our jails. In the United States, there's more people in jail than any other country in the world combined. In the land of the free, in the home of the brave. Everybody's in jail, right? And then why you, can't you get them out of jail? Because you've got all the lobbyists that are selling the toilet paper and the phone calls for like $1.50 a minute when you go there that are going to lobby to keep them in there because the jails have become an institution that makes money. So then they need to keep the drug war going as an example rather than doing something smart and like taking about a tenth of the money and applying it towards people to go get recovered from drug addiction and alcoholism might be a better track, come on Jesus, and going out there and trying to help people through that and decriminalizing it so that they could actually help people with that rather than incarcerating them for it, it's all jacked up. It's a vicious circle. Every one of these systems, there's no win. There's no win. And the Bible tells us, guess what? Here, I'm here to encourage you. It's gonna get worse. That's what scripture tells us. Here's the deal. We can't fix the institutions, but we can affect individuals within them. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I can share the good news of the gospel through spiritual warfare. We can love on one another. After the last service, a lady who was a jailer came to me and she says, I work in the prison system. She goes, I believe exactly what you said. She goes, it's not just the prisoners, it's the prison system as well. And, and she's like, but I'm encouraged that I can be a light in the midst of that. I could love on my coworkers. I could love on the people that are in there. And that's how God will use us to infiltrate the darkness with light and bring light and hope. These churches that go after changing the political stuff, man, I love them, but they're hopeless. I mean, it's not going to change. You can't put laws into effect to get people to be moral. You have to change their heart, and then you don't need the laws, if that makes sense. Could we be a people on a mission to change hearts and minds? Come on, Jesus. Name me one institution. If you can, after the service, I'll give you this other gift card, maybe. <laughs> maybe I'll be corrupt, too. Um, that has not felt the effects and weight of sin in this world. There's not one. Church, we are in a world, in a war of... <laughs> We are in a world at war, yet sadly, most of us choose to believe it is not true, falling prey to yet another ploy of the devil. Yet in the midst of all this chaos, I believe that God is raising up warriors, people who are willing to get on their knees, people who are willing to fast, people who are willing to pray, people who are willing to sacrifice, people who are willing to get dirty to rescue people from the captivity of the devil. 
And I'm going to pray a bold prayer, and you're welcome to bail out of here if you want. I'm going to pray a prayer that God would allow us to see in the spirit the true nature of the war that we find ourselves in, that it would compel us, knowing the reality of heaven and hell, that we would live on mission like never before. I had the privilege and honor of going to a place in Israel called Yad Vashem. And Yad Vashem is the place where they um, kind of commemorate the Holocaust and all of its horrors. And outside of Yad Vashem, they have a place called the Garden of the Righteous Among the Nations. There's these trees that they planted, and at the foot of each of the trees is someone's name. They have a little plaque that's there, and, and one of those plaques has the name of Schindler. You might have seen the movie Schindler List, right? So I would encourage you, if you've never seen that movie, it's very hard to watch, but go watch Schindler's List. And, and Schindler saw the plight of the Jewish people in the midst of the Holocaust, and he did whatever he could to save one more. He's attributed to saving over 1,100 Jewish people from dying during that season. The end of the movie, he has like a watch. It's his last remaining asset that he has. And he's like, I'm going to get rid of my watch just so I could save one more. I mean, that's the kind of spirit that he had. Um, not too long ago, we showed the movie uh, clip ending of Hacksaw Ridge with Desmond Doss. And Desmond Doss was there, if you recall that movie, another hard one to watch. You know, bombs exploding all around him. The nature of the war in the natural is there just surrounding him. Yet he's willing to run through those bombs. He's willing to run through the blood, willing to run through the muck to go save yet one more. He kept saying, just let me save one more. Just let me save one more. God, if you will it, would I save one more? And I, I forget the exact number, but I think he was attributed to saving over 80-something American soldiers that, that time. And uh, might that be the kind of spirit that God would put on our heart, where we really see the nature of this war that surrounds us, and that we would be the kind of people that would engage in our communities, that would engage in our workplaces, that would engage in these corrupt systems and go out there and win one more for Jesus. I pray that will be you. I pray that will be me. So now that I've left you feeling completely hopeless, let me inspire you by giving you a battle plan for success in spiritual warfare. God does not leave us powerless in our generation. He does not leave us powerless in the midst of this. In fact, he equips us as special forces to take ground for the kingdom of God. Second Chronicles 23, alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Now that we're aware of the nature of the spiritual battle that surrounds us, I pray you're alarmed. I pray you're like Jehoshaphat. You're like, man, I've been woke up. Something's going on here, and it ain't right, but I can make a difference. So alarmed, he sought counsel with the Lord. What does that mean? He got on his knees, and he started praying. God, would you give me discernment? God, would you give me wisdom? God, would you move on our behalf? In a couple seconds, you're going to see where he starts reminding God of some of his promises. Lord, I need you to come through. Lord, I need you. I need your help. So he gets on his knees, and he begins to pray. And he calls a fast. He fasts. He abstains from food. These are things that have been normal spiritual practices for most Christians up until our generation. They would fast and they would pray and God would move. They would fast and they would pray and God would move. Have you forgotten about that in your own life? When's the last time you fasted? How often do we get on our knees? You think, see, I think it's something that we've lost to a degree in our generation, but what pain could be avoided and what victories could we see if we were to put these things into practice in our life on a regular basis? Kind of like working out and eating right, right? So if you work out, you eat right, who knows what diseases and other pains and challenges you avoid in your physical body by doing that, right? We'll never know what things God has protected us from during times of prayer and fasting. We'll get to see the joy of some of the victories as well. But man, what could happen if our culture continued to change in this regard? How would the city of Jacksonville look if we were to apply these principles? Some easy ways to start to do that. The first Thursday of every month, except for July. In July, we always do the July 4th outreach. It tends to happen right around that night. Sign up for the outreach, go out there that time. But starting back in August, we gather together the first Thursday of every month. We fast for 24 hours. 
from the previous sundown till the time we get there at the conclusion of the service. Many of us do this. Last time they fasted and interceded and prayed for salvations to happen. And we show up about 100 to 150 of us. We come in this very room. We get on our knees. We pray. We intercede. We beg of God to move on our behalf. We pray for our fellows. We pray for the lost. We pray and ask God to move. How would it look if like 500 of us showed up on a night like that? So maybe the next time that comes around, if you want to dive into a little bit of fasting and prayer, what a great way to come and learn how to get some breakthroughs and see how that would happen. So be on the lookout for that opportunity when it presents itself. I know we're here in second service, but at 9 a.m. every Sunday, there's 15 or 20 people that come and faithfully pray and intercede over our services, praying that God would move that day, praying that some would give their lives to the Lord, praying that others would have a breakthrough. What could happen if there are 50 people in that room instead of 15 or 20? Man, we're getting beat up all around us all the time, and then we still do the same stuff, and we wonder why we don't get any different results. How might life look different if we did exactly what Jehoshaphat said that day? I am convinced that fasting and prayer is a greatly underutilized weapon in our spiritual warfare arsenal. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's turn back to the story of Jehoshaphat for just a moment. It highlights his prayer. I'd like to begin to ask the worship team to come back up. You might have noticed our service order is a little bit different today. We're going to do two songs as we conclude. And the first one, we're going to put into practice some of the things that we've already learned. We're going to do some spiritual warfare. Then we're going to take communion together as a faith family. And we're going to believe that God is going to do some awesome miracles in the lives of the people of Journey Church. So what did he pray? How did he cry out with the people? Starting in verse 5. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and the house of the Lord, much like we're doing today, before the new court, and he said, O God, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations, and your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. He's reminding God of who he is, but he's reminding himself and the people who are listening of who God is. Our God is still on the throne. Our God is still the king of the universe. Who can stand against our God? Who can stand against whatever's opposing you, whatever horde is coming against you, whatever challenges you're faced with, whatever sickness might be in your body? We serve a God who still heals, a God who still delivers, a God who still sets free, a God who will give you victory. He rules. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? He calls us a friend. Think about it. Israel still exists today. It's a miracle. This scripture that we're reading right now is still being fulfilled in our own generation. In the last days, God is still protecting Israel. He remembers his covenant. He remembers his promises. We forget them. Would you be reminded today of just how good and glorious he is? And they have lived in it and have built in it for you a sanctuary for your name saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword judgment or pestilence or famine we will stand before this house and before you for your name is in this house and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save when we open these altars in just a few moments for a time of prayer i want you to believe what we just read Mary, Joe, myself, other leaders, we would be more than happy to join hands with you. In fact, I encourage you to do that. We will anoint you with oil. We will stand in the gap with you. We will believe God with you for whatever victory it is that you need, for whatever discernment you need, for whatever wisdom, knowledge, and understanding you need the Holy Spirit to impart to you. If you need healing in your physical body, we believe that God will hear and save. And now behold, the men of Amnon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came into the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given to us to inherit. He's remembering that there is a real horde coming against us. There's a real battle that you're facing, maybe in the natural, but also in the spiritual. Remind yourself that the devil is trying to take you out, but you have the victory in Jesus, right? 
Remember these things. Apply these things. Our God, will you not execute judgment against them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Whatever circumstances you're faced with, you might not know what to do. Keep your eyes focused on him. When you look at the systems of this world and the pain that they're in because of the weight of sin, guess what? You can be that light in the midst of the darkness. I would ask you to rise with me. Please, everybody, stay focused. There'll be a little bit of movement during this time. If you'd like to come up to the altars, feel free to do so. Hold off on communion after this first song. We're going to take communion together as a faith family. But let us together, in the spirit, during this time of worship, cry out to God for victory. Can I get an amen? Cody, take it away. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my soul. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my soul. Still I do.
God, we fix our eyes on you. Have your way in this place, our great God. today and father we pray for discernment we pray for wisdom we pray for understanding and lord i do pray a scary prayer over the people of journey church that you would give us eyes to see the real nature of the spiritual battle that surrounds us that we would not stand in fear maybe we would be alarmed for the first time as jehoshaphat was but may it call us to our knees may it call us to prayer may it call us to fasting, may it call us to breakthroughs. We're going to read in your word in just a moment. As you broke through on behalf of the people of Israel, I believe you will break through in our generation, even as the days in which you walked in those streets of Jerusalem were under Roman control, and many of the institutions in that day, if not all of them, were also under the power of the prince of the air who will one day be defeated. Lord, we come before you and we pray over these various things, especially as they pertain to our lives and the lives of those around us. We pray for people who are caught in addiction right now in the name of Jesus, that are succumbed to any mind-altering, mood-altering substance, Lord, that you would remove that need from them right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for for those who might have gotten injured, those who encountered a drug like Oxycontin, Lord, and then it led them down deep, dark roads where now they're addicted to heroin. We pray for them right now, and we lift them up to you, and we ask you to bring breakthrough in their life right now, that you would bring freedom, that you would bring healing, that you would bring hope, that you would bring health, Lord God. We ask you, we bind the devil, the enemy, the thief, the liar from speaking into their lives. We ask you to put good friends around them. Give them a sound mind that, Lord, they could see you clearly, that they would love you dearly, that they would walk in the spirit and get victory over those challenges. We pray for those who right now, maybe in this very room, are considering adultery, those who are bound in pornography, those who are considering leaving their wife, Lord God, would you right now, this very moment, knit their hearts to you and knit their hearts to the ones that you've called them to love, Lord God, that they would not call what is not right right in our generation, Lord, but they would seek the help that comes only from you, that they would not stray with their eyes, but you would cause them to fall all in love with you over again and fall in love with the one that you knit them to right now in Jesus' name. Would you just bring healing and hope and a hedge of protection 
around the marriages of Journey Church. Father, we stand in agreement asking for that protection right now that no devil in hell could come and try to steal, kill, or destroy in the midst of the people of Journey Church. We ask you for help and hope and freedom. We pray for people's finances right now as well, Lord God. We've made many mistakes along the way, and many are saddled with debt. Many are saddled with distrust. They don't trust you in this area of their life. Lord, we ask you that you would instill them with trust, that they would see breakthroughs, that you would give them God ideas that might just be small tweaks that would begin to set their finances in the right direction, that you would give them favor in their workplaces or give them God ideas to create new jobs for others, Lord God, that you would open up the storehouses of heaven on their behalf and that they would see victories, that debt would be forgiven and that income would increase and resources and finances would prevail and that the people of God would be healthy, whole, and free and that those resources could be used not for ourselves but to advance the kingdom of God. Father, we come before you right now and we pray against comfort. We pray against entertainment, Lord. Father, yes, they have a place in our lives. Yes, they're supposed to be a bit of it in which you give us joy. But Father, we pray that those things have not become idols in our lives. We ask you to help us set them down. We ask you to help us to put them by the wayside. We ask you to help us focus on the things that really matter and are eternal. Lord, we ask you to help us be lights in the darkness in our generation. Lord, I pray that you would use these people as SWAT teams, as special forces in your army, that the people of Journey Church would be willing to be like Desmond Doss, would be willing to be like Schindler, that we would be a people in our own generation who want to see one more get saved and are willing to go to any length to do it in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus, our God, our Father, our Savior. And I pray that somebody says amen and gets just a little bit excited about that. Give God some glory today. Ushers, if you could come forward, we're going to get ready to take communion. As they get ready, I want to read you one more set of words of encouragement from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, starting in verse 13. Meanwhile, all of Judah stood before the Lord, as we're doing right now with their little ones, with their wives, and with their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, and Benaiah, the son of Jael, and the son of Matani a Levite and the son of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He gave a word, a word for us today as well. He said, listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Listen, all Jacksonville and its inhabitants. The Lord says to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, They will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You'll find them at the end of the valley east of the wilderness of Jeruel. And you will not need to fight this battle. Stand firm. Hold your position and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord will be with you. I pray we do that. I pray we walk in that kind of spirit and walk in that kind of anointing and watch what God will do. Right now we're going to take communion together as a family. We're going to remember the goodness of our God. We're going to remind ourselves of what he did for us on Calvary's cross when his body was broken, that we might have life, that we might be set free, where he was pierced for our iniquities and for our transgressions. We're going to remember that. We're going to remember his blood that was shed, that we might be saved. And then I pray that inspires us to go out there and reach more people with his great love. But as you've heard today's message, maybe God stirred something in your heart, whether for the first time or maybe you are already a believer, you're just sensing that today you really need to dedicate your life to God or rededicate your life to God. I'd ask you to do this. If that's you, bow your heads, close your eyes for just a second. If you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to Jesus today, Would you do me a favor and put your hand up real high so I could see it? I'd love to pray for you. I see your hand in the back and your hand up here in the front and your hand as well, sir. Thank you, God. Thank you for moving. I see another hand back there. Here's what I'd like to do. For those of you who raised your hand, no reason to be shy. I'd like you to come on up to the front. I want you to be among the first that takes communion. If you raised your hand, would you do me a favor and meet me right up here? Everybody around you is going to clap. You raised your hand. Come on up here. So glad you're here. God bless you. Stand right here for a second. God bless you, sister. So glad you're here. And you, sister, 
Journey, look at God moving. Look at God moving. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Let's pray with them and remind ourselves of the same. Father, we thank you that you still move, that you still change lives, that you still save. And Father, we just pray for those who are bold enough to come up here to the front. Father, we thank you that you're at work in their heart, whether for the first time or as an act of renewal. We just thank you that you've touched them in such a way that they're saying that they want to serve you all the days of their life. And Father, we as believers, we come before you today and stand in agreement with them and publicly declaring ourselves by way of reaffirmation that Jesus, you truly are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. Father, we accept that. We receive it. We are so excited about it. We lay our sins at your feet and we say, Lord, take them from us. We don't want them anymore. Give us the power to overcome it as only you can do. Lord, we make a declaration publicly today that from this moment forward, we will serve you and you alone. We put our idols by the wayside, crush them under the weight of your feet, oh God. We don't want them anymore. Our heart's desire is to serve you and live for you and be engaged in this heavenly battle that's been going on throughout the ages until you come back to bring complete and total victory. We are on your team, oh God. You have called us out as such. Would you do me a favor and give those who came up to the front a big round of applause? There's some people around you who will give you some next steps and some resources to help you just get your walk of faith off to a great step. But everybody else, as they uh, give them one more big round of applause. And as the band kicks back in, would you do me a favor? Come on up and start grabbing the communion elements. At the conclusion of the song, we'll partake together. God bless you.
thank you for this time of worship. And we thank you for what you did on Calvary's cross. Father, we lift up this bread that represents your body that was broken and bruised that we might have life. It's pierced for our iniquities and for our transgressions. Father, we remind ourselves of the victory that happened 2,000 years ago and the victory that will once again happen when you fully return. And Lord, in the midst of it, we want to be on mission for you. Inspire us, encourage us, forgive us for our sins, forgive us for our complacency. Father, we lift up this bread with great joy in our hearts, remembering what you did. You died that we might have life. In Jesus' name, partake. Father, we lift up this cup that represents your blood that was shed that day just outside of the gates of Jerusalem. We'll never know the cost, but Lord, we stand in awe of the fact that you are willing to die for us in the midst of our sin. May we never take it for granted. I'd ask you to take just a moment to contemplate those areas in which you're lacking trust in God. Ask him to reveal them to you, and then we'll ask him to remove them from you. Lord, forgive us for our sins, for they are many. Forgive us for our lack of trust in you. Today we come before you, lifting up this cup with great remembrance in our heart, knowing that you truly do forgive, that you truly do set free. And Lord, I ask you that we would appropriate that reality today, and that whatever areas of sin have beset us, whatever areas where we lack trust, that this very moment you will build up that trust in our hearts and minds that when we walk from this place, we could do so boldly applying all that we have learned today because of the victory that you obtained through the shedding of your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. How awesome is that? If you're here with somebody you know and love, feel free to give them a hug. If you don't know them that well, handshake might suffice. Just one more thing before we close. Just need your attention for one more second. I guess two things. Hey, I wanted to give away the second part of that prize. Autumn Morse. Autumn Morse, if you're here, you checked in. I, I, I haven't met you, I don't think. I might have, but Autumn. Here you go. Give it up for Autumn. Thank you for sharing. Congratulations. Appreciate you doing that. Hey, I got one more scripture to read to you. And just a little reminder, if you're new, come on up and say hello. Be sure to stop by our Next Step station. Love to help you get plugged in. Love to help you get connected. Verses we're reading kind of conclude in verse 18 of 2 Chronicles 20. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down on their faces before the Lord, worshiping the Lord, much as we've done today. And the Levites and the something and the something stood before <laughs> them to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, and they did so with a very loud voice. There was a church I was part of for a long time that had a pretty cool tradition in the way that they went out. They always went out on a high note. The pastor would stand at the stage and he would say, shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. And the congregation, or he would say, hip, hip. And the congregation would say, hooray. So let's try that one time. If I say hip, hip, you're going to say, hooray. that was better than I thought. All right. So, so we're going to do what they did, maybe in a little more contemporary way. But let's shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hip, hip. God bless you guys. Go and live on mission. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Live for Jesus.